All right, guys, in this episode, I'm going to be showing you my podcast workflow. This is the same workflow I use for all of my clients. It's the same workflow that literally has them in and out within sometimes three hours and literally with a video up on YouTube within maybe an hour to two hours after that. It's the same workflow I use to make shows like this. This always tune this is in. Hog talk. This is hog talk, baby. Where the <laughs> drinks are good, but the stories are even better. And this a brand for themselves, or like, yeah. what's one piece of advice no. you, you have? For run, something? fall, get back up. Run, fall, get back up. Yes. Keep doing it. Don't yeah. stop. Yeah, Don't just stop. just do it. <laughs> Hopefully, I added those in post. If I didn't, then I just pointed to nothing. This workflow is seamless. Everything's gonna be linked down below. You guys are gonna enjoy this one. How I'm going to be breaking this video down is into three parts. We have hardware, software, and then the overall process. I'm going to try to keep it high level. I guess we could just start by talking about hardware. The best place to start in terms of the hardware is the soul of the whole workflow, which is my M1 Mac Mini. I bought in because M1 Macs are pretty much taken over, but this thing is the workhorse behind my whole workflow. I and mean, since I've gotten it, I have not looked back. That said, I was upgrading from a pretty old MacBook Pro. So yeah, moving on. The next piece of my kit that is really important would have to be this thing right here, which I'm recording on, which is the Rodecaster Pro. To be honest, I saw no other options in terms of what to choose to build out my studio, especially being I was building an in-home studio. The other options were Zooms and whatnot, but Rode is the cream of the crop. Ease of use, it's just chef's kiss. What else? Partnered with the Rode, I also winded up getting these Rode pod mics. And I have four of these, so including this one, scattered around in the studio. I'll slice in some B-roll there that shows those. And basically I have these wires running through under my couches into those mics and everything is going into the Rodecaster. The reason why I love the Rodecaster is just because one, how easy it is to use, but two, it's one of the first audio uh, devices I looked at and I never felt intimidated by looking at it. Like everything is cleanly labeled, beautiful and colorful, and it just makes sense. I've looked at some audio devices and oh man, it looks like looking at a circuit board and <laughs> there's just like things pointing at different ports and you don't know what connects to what. So many colors with the road, I feel like it's basic. You get your four inputs, four outputs, you get eight sound effects slots, you have Bluetooth option to listen to what's going on the computer and an option to plug a device in, whether that be a cell phone or anything else. It's pretty damn simple. And then it all records locally as well as it can plug into your computer and record via something else, which we'll move into software later. What else? Cameras. What is my podcast workflow without the cameras? My main rig, which is what I'm on right now, is the Sony a7C. Just recently got this thing and I have a Tamron 17 to 28 on it. Love this thing, can't rave about it more. Before I got this one, I had, and I still have, which are my thing one and two, the Sony ZV-1s. I'll slice in some B-roll, but with the Sony ZV-1s, those were the only ones I had in the studio to begin with, and that was what I was using for the most part, and it's still what I use for the most part today. There are these point-and-shoot cameras. They're super powerful. They shoot 1080, uh, 24, 30, 60 frames, and even 120 frames per second. It has Sony's great autofocusing technology. It is a 24 to 70 focal length which is a little problematic. Some people think it's not wide enough, but I think it's plenty wide. And within that focal length, it has an f-stop range between a 1.8 and 2.8, which allows you to achieve some nice bokeh 
And best of all, it has a built-in ND. It's a little cinematic power horse. But honestly, I would recommend it to anyone looking just to get started on YouTube and just looking to use other something other than their phone that is more purposeful so that you don't run the chance of getting distracted with your phone and anything else that comes with using your phone. Yeah, next. Can't forget I talked about the cameras. That's just one half of the beast. Like I have to, part of the workflow is like getting the signal from the camera and what we're seeing in the camera to the computer. And a lot of that has to do with massive long wires. I have these long uh, USB extension cords, daisy chain to capture cards, and that daisy chain to HDMI wires, full HDMI to micro HDMI wires, and each USB cords maybe 25 feet long just to stretch the length of my living room just so I can freely place the camera around and get different angles that said no one needs three cameras to get the thing that's what i have i have two sony tv ones one sony a7c um, and that's how i achieve my three camera angle shots but that partnered with some software i i still have it gives me a lot of capability to play with things and mess around with stuff in terms of lights i pretty much have a basic light setup i would say compared to the rest of my setup just some cheap newer lights from uh, amazon it was a three pack, one came with a soft box. And yeah, right now what you're looking at is one of the lights pointing at me and then one for my hair light, which I don't know if you can see it. I set it up, I'm trying to follow the rules. Hopefully I'm following them correctly, but we'll see. I would say if we're talking about like bonus things for my setup that really help my podcast workflow stand out and, and really drive things home, are my stream deck essential to my workflow in terms of going from scene to scene on the software that I use. My monitor, I have a rolling monitor and I use this as a way for people to see what they look like on camera. Since I started using this, it has been a absolute game changer. It's one thing when you hear yourself through professional mic, but it's another thing when you see what you look like on the feed. Changes the whole game, changes the whole feel of being in the studio, makes things feel a lot more real. And then, important thing, <laughs> the Cal Digit USB-C dock. Oh man, for the life of me, when I was starting this podcast journey, <laughs> for some reason, I never thought that it was going to be a problem that I was daisy chaining all my cameras through one USB port. <laughs> was I wrong on that one? Yeah, the Cal Digit basically saved my life. I remember when I first got my Mac Mini, I was so disappointed when I like took up all the cameras. I was like, wait, this thing is still up. Like, what's going on? I was about to give up. I was like, maybe I just don't have the right equipment. Maybe I need like a supercomputer or something like that. No, I was just overloading my IO basically. And yeah, once I upgraded to the cow digit, literally dedicated one IO to each camera, everything works perfect now. So let's move on to the second part of my workflow, which is the software. When it comes to software, I use Figma, Ecamm, Descript, and Final Cut. <sighs> so let's start with Figma. Figma is basically Adobe Illustrator for the web. Huh, nah, that's an oversimplification. It's more like Sketch plus Illustrator for the web. It's basically a free design tool or free to use design tool. It is probably one of the best tools I've ever used for designing just for the sole purpose that I can bring things up on the browser. That means I can bring up my workflow anywhere. I could go to a friend's place, show them designs. And not only that, the fact that it's web first, it's built asynchronously. I can not only bring up my workflow on people's computers, but I can share links with people and have them bring it up remotely while I'm there still on the file and have them on the file with me. And they can click on my little avatar and follow me around and I can show them through things. I can play prototypes for them. You name it, you can do it on Figma from a design perspective. It has point manipulation and it has vectors. It's a very powerful tool. And honestly, I think it's probably one of the softwares of the future in terms of it just levels the playing field like 
I feel like Adobe, and I feel like I always shit on Adobe for this, but they've backed themselves into a corner where it's power tool only. And therefore, like when you open it, there's just so many things you can do. And for new users, that's just very intimidating. And I feel like with newer softwares, they're able to take different approaches that allow people to easily grasp them and achieve things on them. That said, there is there is something to being in the Adobe workflow, but I think there's also something to creating a workflow when you have software from other parties talking together. And that's what I've been doing with my workflow. And Figma is one of the big components to that within my workflow. I would say the next one close to that would be Ecamm. Ecamm is the powerhouse. Ecamm is what connects my cameras and my roadcaster together to give you what you see here, which is one stream, one feed, where we have the beautiful quality of my Sony camera, but with the audio quality of the road mic and all the technology within the roadcaster and how they're built to talk to each other. And I even have noise gate on here because I'm in my apartment and it's not perfect. It is loud here, but yeah, Ecamm is this all in one, basically TV studio on your computer. Um, you can trigger overlays, you can switch cameras, you can create unlimited digital crops of camera angles, um, you can trigger videos, you can plug in so many different inputs into Ecamm and literally have your own TV show. Um, and that is exactly what I do for my clients. And that's what I'm going to start doing for myself now. The third part of my workflow in terms of software is a tool called Descript. Descript is a video and audio editor, except it flips on its head and it allows you to edit video and audio by editing a transcript. So imagine as easy it is to delete something from there is as easy it is to delete something you said in an audio clip or in a video. And basically it transcribes to 95% accuracy which is pretty crazy when you think about it. And it just allows for a very seamless workflow when just clipping away from video. And that's mainly what I use Descript for. I use Descript to chop at my video and really edit my video to shorten things up and as well as just add things that I may have missed or may have wanted to say. And it helps me really summarize things because it'll even do the little dipping where it'll fade those clips in together, but it'll make those clips feel like they belong together. It will make it feel like, oh, that was meant to happen like that. It's easier when you do it in audio only because you don't see that clip jump. In video, you'll still see the jump. They can't do that just yet, but, but yeah. I also use Descript to make clips for my content, which is like another video I'll be making in the future when it comes to turning long form content or pillar content as Gary Vee calls it and creating uh, micro content for specific mediums. The script is a great tool for that just because of that transcript aspect of things. It allows you to just take one medium that is video and strip it apart into all of its individual components, whether that be just the written form, the audio form, and obviously video, which is all of the above. And then last but not least is just Final Cut. I like Final Cut and I choose Final Cut because to me, it's the easiest to use. It makes the most sense. I have a timeline, I have effects that I can drag and drop things on. The iconography seems uh, attainable for me. I, under I can grasp it. The cut looks like a blade. Nothing is out of the ordinary, unlike Premiere, which is to me, just like a bat out of hell. And uh, what's the other one that people use? Uh, DaVinci Resolve. Oh, I thought I was gonna love DaVinci Resolve when I first used it. Oh, how wrong was I? Such a great concept in terms of trying to create the workflow of doing video, except when they keep you in those silos and you're trying to design and you can't really preview your design because you have to keep going back and forth. I just gave up on that. But yeah, Final Cut is my video editor of choice. I guess on the side note, you could also say that I do edit in LumaFusion which is what I used to edit in or what I started video editing in on my iPad Pro, which I also may do some videos on that in the future. Who knows? Anything's possible. What else? I guess when it comes to talking about the workflow itself for my podcast, it generally starts with me creating assets in Figma or Final Cut. And assets are literally, if they're in Figma, they are 
transparent PNGs or PNGs in general, which all PNGs can be transparent. And I usually do this for my lower thirds or a little splash screen, whether that is a like and subscribe or like a card screen, where it's like a the essential equivalent of uh, someone's business card, where it's just like a splash page. And that says like their business information or something like that. Recently, I did create some cool scenes where I was like, messing with 3d effects and like having things overlaid so that they can interact with the scene you can have a lot of fun with it this is what i do in figma and i transfer these things into ecamm you can also create these assets via final cut just videos i created my intro video and in final cut and you can bring all of these things into ecamm like i was saying ecamm is truly magical i prefer ecamm over obs and streamlabs just because again it's just it's easier for me to grasp. It just made sense. It was one of the tools that I was able to open up. I think I tried them both on the same day. And the fact that I was able to be up and running on Ecamm just proved to me that was the one I needed to use. But yeah. So yeah. After I create all my assets in Figma, I start to create my scenes in Ecamm. And creating those scenes is as easy as just dragging and dropping. I have a whole bunch of folders in my Ecamm because I have a client and I usually create scenes for different clients and I'll hop into those folders for those different clients. But yeah, I usually start by just creating a folder and start clicking plus. I usually quickly select what the scene is drawing from, whether it's a camera angle or whether it's a screen share or whether it's like a video that you want to play and then you go from there and you just add overlays you can choose to lock them into place and essentially you can trigger all these scenes with a click you can trigger them with your keyboard but for me my power tool is to trigger them with my stream deck which i mentioned before in my hardware yeah which was like five minutes before this on to the next one the next step after this is to assign my scenes to my stream deck which is pretty damn easy stream deck is you open up the app and basically it just shows you like these little empty squares especially if you're starting from scratch you can create different profiles so you can trigger my profiles based on who i'm filming for so if i'm filming for one client i'll trigger their profile and all the buttons will change and i can have those hot commands to easily switch between cameras or switch between scenes, I mean, even trigger overlays or start the recording or even call someone in a via for interview. Literally possibilities are endless on the stream deck. Um, they even have plugins for to do other things on your computer, whether that be playing things on Spotify or whatever you want it to be. And the next step is setting my angles and lights. This one's more physical, just literally exactly what it is. Setting my angles, setting my lights. And lastly, it's just shooting. Well, once you click record on Ecamm, sometimes I like to click record on the roadcaster just to have a backup of the audio file. But yeah, once you record, you're pretty much good to go. The one important thing to know in this workflow is when you're using Ecamm and you're switching between cameras, you're going to get one full video file at the end with the audio assigned to it. But the cuts that you made during the video are final that is the it's the positive and the negative to my workflow it's what allows me to keep things so fast and allows me to crank things out but the negative to it is there's no take backs so if you switch to a camera angle by mistake and that person was digging up their nose you're living with that mistake but that's when i introduce descript into my workflow and i basically can edit or cut anything that i want out of it just by cutting it out of the transcript but that said there are workarounds on ecamm while you can record things all through the feed you can choose to still record on your cameras locally and still record through ecamm while that may be taxing on your camera and you may have to you know supply power from other sources just so your camera stays on it is still possible and then you can still throw those files off and still edit them in post and do everything you need to do just for me and my workflow to keep things fast i keep everything in ecamm i switch everything and to be honest i've just been getting better at switching to the right cameras at the right times and listening to the podcast and listening to the flow of things and predicting when others are going to talk and creating scenes where there are multiple people in the scene so that if everyone's talking, I can just quickly go to that scene. And I don't have to pogo back and forth between someone. But trust me, the more you use Ecamm, the more you do this, the better you'll get at switching, especially if you're doing it for yourself. I'm still learning that myself. It I've recorded 
two podcasts so far. One where I was doing it myself and I was all over the place on that one. That was the first one. The second one where my girlfriend was actually switching for us. That one was better, obviously, because someone else was switching for us. And yeah, that's pretty much my entire podcast workflow. I don't think I missed anything, but if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask them down below. I will be answering anything you guys. I, I want to create a community here where we can help each other succeed and achieve our dreams and goals. Honestly, the barrier for entry to just getting into the entertainment industry has been lowered. We are living in the best time. is the best time to be a human being. Um, and I don't care what you think, like that is just the truth. And we need to take advantage of this. So I wanna help you do exactly that. So with that said, I will catch you in the next episode of Copy and Steal. Peace.